Thank you very much, sir, for um, walking us through all those Philippine objects that we can uh, find in Spain. It's really overwhelming. <laughs> and uh, um, so at this point, we would like to call on the speakers in front with uh, Christina to moderate this panel, to moderate this discussion. Hi, good morning. Um, so we, we, we thought about doing this panel, this kind of roundtable discussion, uh, mainly because of um, kind of our, in Philippine studies at SOAS, our, our major kind of uh, impetus or goal is really to provide access to materials, digital, I mean, archival objects, or, or at least to begin the conversation on repatriation. So, um, or, uh, so we we do a lot of digital humanities projects here, um, and that's how the, uh, for example, the, the manuscripts from the San Agustin, and then we do a sound archiving. Michael is here. We're working on uh, the sound archives of Southeast Asia, uh, and we seek to try to give access to this. No, um, we uh, we and then we also have material objects. So we have the map. board for, for Spain, uh, kind of because of, uh, yeah, this is kind of the major goal of Philippine studies at SOAS. So um, I invited Ricky uh, also so we can discuss about material culture, but I would like to begin uh, or to take the conversation we had um, for, uh, earlier this morning about um, what can be done you know, to give access to materials, not necessarily even outside of the Philippines, but maybe even in, in the Philippines itself in terms of manuscripts. What can be done um, to yeah, give access to these materials, maybe begin the conversation of repatriation it could also be digital repatriation as what we are doing with the San Agustin Library uh, by putting it together on a digital platform. So I guess um, we can begin with um, asking, for example, Ino, if you can, uh, if you can give us kind of a sense no, of what the National Archives in the Philippines would, uh, is, what are your par par plans to give more access to archives, uh, to the Philippine archives. Sorry, so many bottles. <laughs> yeah, um, well, we've put, uh, we've, uh, in the National Archives, we put up our, our um, we've now put online our catalogs, no? Mm -hmm. Uh, it's we're we are we're trying to um, work out that we to put uh, to put online uh, copies of the of the records, you know, especially the Erección de Pueblos, which is quite popular with our researchers. Uh, but there, you know, it's a problem that uh, the part of the issues that we face are or the challenges that we face is uh, one of them is that um, there's not enough uh, space. Mm -hmm. uh, on the in on the internet it would really make the the loading of records on our website to be very slow you know? oh, okay. so we we've decided to work first with the cat to to put up the catalogs no um and then we part another thing is of course publications and and exhibits mm -hmm. we we've been doing a lot of exhibits on our, our archival records but usually focus on a particular region and that's one way that people get to see the records or get to know more about us. Mm -hmm. But a lot of it is really just making people aware that, mm -hmm. you know, the archives is the archives office is open, and that um, though we we only now serve digital copies mm -hmm. to the public, 
And right now, much of it is accessed through our reading room. Uh, but uh, we will be setting up parallel reading rooms in Davao and in um, Cebu. Mm -hmm. no? So that, that whatever is available in Manila will also be available in Cebu. Right now, um, our, we read, uh, Cebu and Davao already both have our Cebu offices and our Davao office. We've just be, uh, bought two buildings in Davao. And um, in the future, we will be setting up archival centers in, um, in these two cities, but also in other parts of the country. So to follow up, are uh, researchers required to be physically in one of your... Sorry. So to follow up, are, are researchers required to be physically in one of your reading rooms? Uh, or is it accessible from one's home? Uh, as long you, as can, you, you can look up the catalogs in the, uh, from on the internet, no? Mm -hmm. but, um, but just to a large extent, our, cat, our collection is, uh, is, be, is only uh, visible or can be only be viewed or used in the reading rooms. I see. I see. So you can plan ahead. Yeah. So you, it has to be done that way. But um, uh, a part of the problem is really that we cannot load too many documents, as many documents as we want. No. Mm -hmm. So it could it be possible to be served from an outside institution, so that there's. Like yeah. Well, you can. They're actually accessible. Um, there's a whole set of the records in CSIC. In Spain, ah. in Spain, no, so that they they are, I mean, uh, we there's an agreement between us for them to use, for them to serve it as well. Oh, digitally. So all the records are are pretty much oh okay. So we um, are there any like um, one of a kind records in the National Archives that um? Well, every everything by definition. <laughs> It's one of a kind. No, I mean without copies in Sisik. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Sisik uh. doesn't have the second half of our collection. They mm. only have the first half, um, which is the only one that was being used at that time. The, the there's a whole the eight million records that have never been uh -huh. have never been shown to the public. Wow. Yeah. So our history was written without these records available. Wow. wow. Okay. Now, when you say the um. 8 million records, do you mean they're physical, right? Yes. And and so are they all in the process of being digitized right yes. now? Yes. I mean, one half is already digitized. Okay. Uh, and that's the half that we now are, are, are that are now available in the reading room. But the, and this is the half that's never been seen. Mm, okay. You know? But our, our biggest problem really is that um, we need people like jo Jody and to do <laughs> catalog and you know, read the documents. Oh, so it's also a problem. We, we have, we have at least, I mean, we've Christina. been studying Spanish. I mean, the, right. the, the, we have an arrangement with Instituto to study Spanish for the past 10 years or eight years. Mm. But it takes more than that. Then you have to learn to read uh, records with Christina. No? So we need scholars to also, because it, it's not been cataloged in, in no, a way. They, they, it, 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 they used, I mean, They've been cataloged before, but uh -huh. we, you know, we still have the eight million that have never been seen, no? Uh -huh. So that has to be cataloged, indexed, if possible. Wow. And you probably need to have our colleagues uh, transcribe them to make them accessible. Yes, and yes. Readable. Yeah. Well, yeah. That's right. part of the. And then That's you know, we find it's very hard to find people now who will do that for us. And our, our Spanish-speaking uh, personnel have now got, moved on, no? Because one of the beauties, I guess, of digital of a digital platform, no, is like it's for the record for the San Agustin uh, Library, for example. Uh, once it's up there, people can work on it. There's like crowdsourcing, of course, very quality. Uh, you know, you have to look at the quality. Yeah. But once once they are accessible online, I guess, then it's easier to. Because uh, looking, for example, at UST, which has done, I think, a very amazing work on digitizing. Can you talk a bit about your, I know, from your former <laughs> institution? Well, uh, I think that's one of my greatest frustrations is uh, in that uh, the digitization has been moving very slowly. 
and the uploading of the material is also not up to par. So uh, I was, I've been trying to <clears throat> have an assistant who is more technically savvy than me, wow. who will know how to manage the digital files, but that hasn't come to pass. Um, so I keep on, I keep on uh, um, pressing the Dominicans to have uh, uh, an assistant to work on these things. Now, uh, there was a projection yesterday with, you know, Archiba is, uh, Archiba de la Universidad de Santa Mas really right there uh, over the page. You know? And so um, we are talking to have those <laughs> very, uh, I own this document kind of thing in a more decent, uh, uh, discreet uh, line. Uh, watermark is the watermark. So we're working to have the watermarks. I, I, you know, the the digitization goes to a historical process of first limiting the access, then um, opening them up slowly. And I think there's a kind of an old school with the archivists very protective of the documents. Even my staff were like that. Uh, and so I have to, we have to work out that um, the fears are overcome. Mm. And um, a lot of it has, a lot of the improvement has been due to the influx of scholars. Mm. So the more the scholars, as Ina said, the more the scholars come there, the more, um, and the staff will know what the collection is, the more the staff will know the significance of the collection, and the more they will be inspired to work better for the um, faster as, um, accessibility of the documents. I, it's a continuing process, but I think that um, it's the influx of scholars. Right now in the UST, um, there are more scholars outside than from the inside. So that is what I'm always talk, telling the Dominicans. We are sitting on a mountain or a series of or mountain range of treasures <laughs> that that, uh, that we have to take that we have to be cognizant of. And of the for, of, of the researchers from the outside, there's a good number from the foreign side. So it's also not just a matter of scholars coming in, but I think of local scholars coming in. Because you, you see the papers and articles written on history, and they're mostly the, are written about the Japanese period, the American period, the Marcos era, the Duterte era, but very little on the Spanish period. Obviously, because they are one in fear of the Spanish language, two they don't they hate the Spanish period. It's a it's a very negative attitude that I find all over the Philippines, and it's a constant battle. We need the wings of angels to. Uh, and bring the message of uh, research to more mundane levels. I think also I'd like to um, bring up uh, a challenge. Sometimes you mentioned, Ricky, that sometimes the archivists are so protective of their territory. And I was wondering if there was any way that we could begin to change this uh, Filipino tendency to Oh, to, to keep information to themselves, right? It's like, oh, this is my information and it's, it's just, I'm going to do this and not, not just sharing Filipina. it with anyone. <laughs> it's not just Filipino. Um, I've encountered it in many awesome. archives that they, right. and I asked them, why don't you share the entire document? And they just say they don't want to. Right, so <laughs> they don't want to. <laughs> Because they want to publish on it, but 20 years no, no, later. No, no, no. Yeah. So um, is there a way that we could kind of uh, go beyond that and, and you know, sort of help contribute to this change in attitude that we accomplish more uh, together than, you know, keeping these, uh, these sources secret? Um, you know, it's, how can we do that? Is there a way, maybe from the audience, we could hear any thoughts you might have on rectifying that misnotion that I'm going to do this by myself rather than, you know, having a, a group effort? I, I think uh, from my one point of view, um, it's to, in, to um, invite, uh, I guess the, the archivist will have to have a kind of scholarly bent mm. because if you're an archivist you're a manager of documents right and then you don't up really 
appreciate what your collection has. But I was already a scholar before getting to be in the archives. So I knew the, the wealth of information. And then it, from day one, I was trying to spread the information about what we have in UST. And I invited scholars to come, etc. cetera. Um, so it's a matter of um, molding or forming the archivists mm -hmm. into a scholarly approach. And one way would be um, conferences like these where we invite the head archivists or assistant archivists mm -hmm. to present papers about specific topics. So <clears throat> that kind of moves them into some project that will right. make them. Right. Excuse me. Um, may I interrupt? Um, since uh, Professor Dr. Baker uh, invited questions from the audience, may I uh, just um, call on uh, people from Zoom. Two people have raised their hands. Yes. Uh, but before that, I'd like to just ask one that has been messaged to me personally. I'll take advantage of the opportunity. And the Zoom audience will call you after this one. Um, to uh, Director Manalo, um, also regarding access to uh, documents in the archives, um, and you're uh, particularly related to what you presented. You said earlier that uh, you were going to offer a survey of the documents in the archives um, on the British invasion. Uh, can you please tell us more about the documents that um, in the holdings of the National Archives uh, in, within that period? What are the nature What's the nature of these documents? Um, are they cataloged? Uh, yeah, it's a bunch of questions here, but uh, are these mostly accounts by the religious, military, and colonial Spanish officials and the state of the documents if they are legible? Yeah, that's an essay question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, wait, um, well, um, as uh, as I was saying, I mean, you see, you saw in, you heard from my talk on that, what I was reporting on was a uh, was a um, uh, religious uh, report of a religious uh, person. No? Uh, so what we have is all kinds of things. No? Because I I think I was trying to explain that about the archives that it's really an arbitrary collection of whatever could be grabbed from. The, the departing Spanish uh, uh, officers, no, and turned over to the Americans um, in the early, the first years of the American occupation. So, um, so there, there are all kinds of things, no. And uh, as I, I think I said earlier, there are about three hundred. So far, we've found three hundred eighty plus pages of um, of records related to the occupation. The British occupation, and we will be searching for more, and then come up with a list as our contribution. No, and uh, I already mentioned two examples. One was a report on the silver that was taken from from different churches. No, and the churches are named. Another is a report on looting, but these are very short records. Do you think we can have them digitized <laughs> and, uh, yeah, yeah. and the, put, the, them, the, put them up somewhere for uh... certainly that I, I can see now that you can do we can do it a project based yes maybe yeah. that's the way forward no yeah yeah to have very specific topics and mm -hmm. then kind of create a list and then digitize give access to yeah we, we're just trying I'm just trying to um to to you know to, to connect that to archival practice in that sense that we try our best to provide the entire record series no mm. um, not just selected ah. records but i guess when if there's a topic one could one one can select no maybe that's a that's a good way to start no parang small small yeah, 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 yeah. very contained yeah. and then have a bibliographic reference yes. and then mm -hmm. digitize it yeah yeah oh Okay, um, so I'll call on, yeah, there are three raised hands. May, can we alternate? Uh, I'll call uh, one from the room and one from Zoom, and then we do it like that. So first I saw Hobie's hand raised. Yeah. Um, my question is directed to um, um, the Spanish occupation. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the 
Uh, sorry, Hobi, I think you'll have to come here so that the Zoom sorry. participants can hear your question as well. From, from here? Um, yeah. Uh, the last time I was at the National Archives was pre-pandemic. And uh, one of the things we got to use was in the computers uh, was this uh, e-catalog, which was uh, uh, a, a green a green catalog where you could type search terms and it would essentially search through the card catalog of direcciones de, uh, de pueblos and the various provincias. Um, what are the plans to make that as well accessible via the NAP website? Because that would be fantastic. Yeah, as I said, we're studying it, and there's a there's an issue of how much we can put on online. I mean, how how much the website can carry. Now, um, we will still have to work out a proposal to probably be able to to put it on the internet. I mean, to have it, no? Uh, yes, we have an e-catalog, and that's for uh, the section that I mentioned that hasn't been hasn't been seen before. And uh, this is a section that has mostly been digitized. That's this, the first section is not yet uh, has not yet been completely digitized. Oh, we, we've also digitized the collection of the Archdiocese of Nueva Segovia of, uh, of, in, based in Vigan. And that one is available also on, but it, it won't be available online. It will be available on, from the reading rooms. Is there a reason why it's not available online? Because of the servers? Uh, that's partially the reason, but we haven't worked. The Archdiocese of uh, Nueva Segovia has not yet worked out their protocols. Uh, okay. I'll call um, someone from Zoom, uh, one of the participants, um, Regina Lim. Uh, I. Regina, did you raise your? Would you like to ask a question? Okay, so I've asked her to unmute, have but she hasn't catalog. unmuted. Yeah, so anyway, um, if she hasn't, um, I'll call on Christy. Can we get it online, Kaya? Yeah, that's our goal, in fact, but right now mm -hmm. it's really the bandwidth. The, uh, yeah, I guess I... Um, was to express like sadness that when I started my doctorate uh, studies in 2011, there was I had much greater access um, to materials to study the Spanish Pacific, both in the NAP. Um, I've used a lot of these collections in my forthcoming book and the um, AGN in Mexico, and both of those collections now are much um, more like more closed and more limited to researchers. Um, my question would be that one of the one of the digital sources or, or series I've discovered is the um, digitized records of the Church of Latter-day Saints, which has amazing um, collections. But to access them, you need to be a member of the church um, and you need a church login. So anyone who's a Mormon can see them, but anyone who's not is denied access. So I wonder if um, there's been any work um, from from the Philippines or from SOAS to kind of negotiate. You know, who why why is this why is access to this heritage uh, restricted to people of a certain faith. Um, also, that you can see the documents in the um, family research centres, but because of COVID reasons, you know, they've, they've been closed or, um, you know, you might not live in a city that has one of those centres globally. Um, and my second question would be, um, what initiatives are there, if any, to, to work with a uh, local community, like, state governments or with um, parish level to kind of explore what kind of records from the you know early colonial period exist within the philippines outside of um, manila and are there efforts to kind of doc to kind of catalog and preserve these like local records yeah. Is that, yeah. okay. uh, first of all I, I i'm a bit but I'm, I'm a bit concerned about what you said you think that your perception is that Records are less available now. Yeah. 
Yes, well, that, that is true. Um, it's conservation and security. You know, we've had so much theft um, that we've decided not to uh, not to let the original records be handled by the public. But we will digitize it. Usually, we have an we we need uh, you know uh, two weeks in advance to be able to digitize it. And we're quite, from my understanding, is we're quite um, up to date. Um, there are reports that it takes longer, but that, that would, I mean, that may, sometimes there's a problem like when we're moving or something like that, no? But uh, generally, we're able to give it within two weeks um, if you want to look at a particular set of records, no? And as to regard, with regard to um, the, the, the communities, I mean, well, smaller collections outside of Manila, as I was just mentioning earlier, um, we've, we've digitized the the collection of one of the oldest archdiocese of the Philippines, which is Nueva which unfortunately was partially destroyed, I mean, partially damaged by an earthquake recently. So they're also gonna have to move, you know. But the, the records are, are intact and they're now digitized, completely digitized. Thank you. I think Rick, okay. Ricky uh, wants to follow up. Yes. Uh, that was, there was a question from Christy about the family records. Um, so we now have a Data Privacy Act, which is um, quite uh, very strict and, um, yeah, very strict. Uh, we were working in my uh, last term as archivist of UST for the turnover of the and the records from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, or the saints to be short, uh, from them to, to us. Um, so that's a long, that, there's a long history behind that. Uh, in the 1970s, the saints were already uh, microfilming the records all over the country, um, only where the bishops allowed them to move. So there were cases where um, some dioceses were not available. And then there are horror stories that, uh, for example, in Valladolid in Negros Occidental, they refused entry and the church burned. No. So all <laughs> the records are also lost. So things like these. So the um, whatever was microfilmed was um, turned over eventually to the archdiocese, to the archives of UST in the also about the 1970s in very good um, film, uh, except for the Archdiocese of Manila. The Archdiocese of Manila retained the collection for Manila itself, but for the rest of the country, we have them in UST, um, in microfilm, and that's well preserved. Um, and then uh, we just learned that from a representative of the, of the saints that they had disposed of the microfilm collection because they had digitized them. So we are the only ones who have now the microfilm. Uh, so we're now also negotiating for the digital version so that it's easier to, to uh, locate. And uh, we already got one terabyte, one, one of these gadgets, uh, uh, turned over from, the, uh, from Archbishop Villegas uh, in UST. But then the, the saints realized that the, do, the donation proper has to be done from the church of the saints to the Catholic Bishops Conference of the Philippines, which we achieved in 2019. That's all there now. And then the pandemic broke out. And then so, and then I left, sorry. <laughs> so it's still, it's still in CBCP and we are pushing the, my, our counterpart in USC, the Secretary General to work with the Secretary General of CBCP to turn over those terabytes, they're about 12 or something like that to UST. Now, uh, the more memorandum of agreement has been worked out, it's okay. It's just that the footwork and the angels, the wings of angels really have to fly faster um, to, do, to do that. Um, but again, you know, when, once we get those terabytes in the UST, we already also, we have also set, we have uh, obtained the help of the Prefect of libraries to house the collection so that you can access them uh, suitably in the library. But again, like in the NAP, now if that will happen, 
it will still be available only in only USD, on not and cannot be. That's always the question. Cannot be put. Uh, yes. uh, cannot be uploaded for reasons of the Privacy Act. So, so it's not just server space; it's also Privacy Act. Yes, the server. law, the law. But these are only for family records, or. Yeah, the, uh, the canonical records that Hobie we see was talking oh, about. Hobie. So that's the, the whole breadth of baptism, confirmation, marriage, there. Uh, that's there. So um, there are other ways to go around that where you can access the microfilm uh, in USD. Mm. Uh, it's lower. And then you can also go to the individual dioceses, which will be more expensive. But for example, in Batangas, they have uh, opened a new archive in San Jose, Batangas, which we also help to organize. Um, and that's available. That that's I think that's the oldest set, one of the oldest sets of documents in Batangas province in San Jose. Okay, may I just read one question in Zoom? Okay. And then uh since it's 1209. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I think Ian is going to talk a bit about the national the memory project. Oh, the memory project. Okay. Um, I think he's there. Uh let's I, see. I invited him to talk about the National Historical Commission of the Philippines has oh. a memory project digitizing some of the archival material they were able to purchase um from uh, archives in spain ian ian is ian there um no i don't see him oh he's not there no he was earlier but uh, uh okay Masiga, so right now uh, no, 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 the question uh is he a, okay maybe panelist let's see panelist Yes, oh, Ian is here. Um, Ian, uh, would you, you like put his video to on. unmute? Can you uh, ask to unmute? Yeah, can, can you uh, camera on? <laughs> Are you around, Ian? <laughs> I've asked him to unmute. Uh, I think he can. can click on that one. And He's even a co-host. Hi, Ian. Um, so, Hello. Yeah, there. Hi, Ian. Uh, put your video on, Ian. Yeah, can you put your video on? Yes. Yes, welcome. Click. Uh, welcome. Hello, good, good, good morning there. Or good, uh, good afternoon. <laughs> it's good afternoon. 12, it's 12 o'clock here. Welcome, Ian. Um, Christina said uh, you were go you're going to talk about the memory project. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, Christina, am I, am I, do I need to share our? our no, guests? just uh, give. Yes. Okay. Sure. Uh oh. Yes. Actually, um, the National Historical Commission of the Philippines launched last year, October 2020 our review project. It is called the National Memory Project Philippines. Uh, basically, it, it aims to democratize the historical materials of the NHCP uh, located in our historical data bank, in our library in the central office in Manila, and also some objects, historical objects, uh, ephemera, photographs, and and materials associated with the national heroes found in 27 museums across the country of the NHCP. So as of now, what is available online is the online public access catalog of the materials found in the NHCP. You can access it via the National Good Centennial Committee website. Uh, the reason why it is under the National Queen Centennial Committee website, it was funded by that committee in 2020. And because the 500th anniversary celebration in the Philippines had already, glo uh, already closed last April, the website of the Queen Centennial Committee will be absorbed by the NHCP. So uh, we already did it out the, uh, the project and hopefully before the year ends, we will be, uh, I mean, the platform, the digital library platform of the NHCP will be available by the end of the year. So as of now, it is still an OPAC. At least you can navigate, you can you can survey what 
what files or what materials are available in the NHCP. And then uh, one of the features of the memory project, you can, you can, you, you, you can navigate on the you can navigate on the you know, you know, the the materials like if you access the Biblioteca Nacional de España. So you can uh, flip the pages and also another feature of this is you can download the materials for free. So it is similar with the endeavors already uh, made by the University of Santo Tomas through the Benavides Digital Library, the Ayala, Ayala, Li the Ayala Library, the Ayala yeah. Library, and some of the and other major institutions in the county, in, in, you know, in, the, in the whole world, though, like the Biblioteca Nacional, Pares, the US Library of Congress. It's just that the NHCP wants also to contribute its materials to not only to the Philippines, but to the, you know, to the whole world. And we call it National Memory Project and not NHCP Digital Library because we want it to, we, we want other institutions to contribute also in the platform. As of now, there are three, three institutions that committed to contribute in the memory project. And these are the Center for the Pampangan Studies of Holy Angel University in Angeles City, the Cavite Study Center of the De La, of the De La Salle University of Marinas and the Philippine World War II Foundation. And the last one I mentioned is very exciting because they have the rare, rare collection of Jose Abad Santos, one of the heroes of World War II in the Philippines. So hopefully these materials will be available soon. And it is part of our five-year five -year, uh, plan from 2022 to 2026. Thank you, Ian. That's very exciting, no? Um, and hopefully, and it, it's great that we people can contribute to it. So it's an online platform, and it's free to access from anywhere, no? Ian? Yes, ma'am. The only so yes, ma'am. Yeah, yes, The only difference with the endeavors, endeavor being conducted by the SOAS, is that uh, we are digitizing, digitizing, or making a, make, making the materials available based on the library holdings or the archival holdings of the institutions, the participating institutions. Uh, we don't have that capability like you. That, for example, you ask, uh, you ask the library to digitize the material materials and upload it on your platform or the San Agustin Museum. So we don't have that, that capability. So we are only depending on the uh, the commitments copy? of the yes, oh, the commitments yeah. of the institutions uh, that I know that participated in this endeavor of the NHCP. Okay, great. So, oh, Jody, you want the last question <laughs> before we go out for lunch? <laughs> Are there questions for the other family? <laughs> 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 thank you thank you for giving me the last question um thank you to all of the speakers uh, i have a, a question for ricky but it's also addressed to all of the uh, panelists in one way you know i i couldn't help but feel a little bit angry when i saw all of the uh the spears behind the heater of the museum <laughs> yes. uh because i it 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 just reinforced the feeling that they don't need to see the spears and the, the, the Spanish people don't really need the excess of mm. material culture of the Philippines that they have there. What would be the prospects of um, organizing in some way to uh, in, lead an initiative to repatriate mm. materials <laughs> as well as archives? Um, you know, one of the, the things that always impresses me <laughs> Um, in a sad way in, in the Philippines is that students, and this goes back to the comment that you were saying earlier, students uh, have a hard time uh, to imagine mm. the past, you know? Mm. And I always think of that, you know, that uh, uh, Rizal saying, ang hindi marunong uh, lumingon sa pinangalingan ay hindi marunong makarating sa, sa, 
saparodonan, right? The one who does not know how to turn around to the past, to see the past, mm -hmm. does not know how to arrive at the future. And, uh, you know, and, and I think that because students do not have the material basis for imagining the past, what they learn in school is that uh, the Spanish were superior, uh, that they uh, were unjust, mm -hmm. and that uh, everything that was produced in the Philippines before uh, maybe Balagtas uh, is derivative and um, uh, imitative. Mm -hmm. and, and there are centuries of Philippine, uh, Spanish Philippine missionaries and historians who have effectively said the same thing. Filipinos uh, are not original. They don't know how to invent. They don't in innovate, but they're great at imitating the things that we uh, show them. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I, I don't think it's just a, a problem of this generation. I think it's centuries and centuries of colonial miseducation mm -hmm. and colonization mm -hmm. that reinforces the everyday reality that whatever the past was, it it was uh, uh, done by an oppressive and superior people upon a diminutive and, and shameful uh, heritage, uh, uh, our heritage. And, and, and so I, I think that on some level, on every level, we have to, to fight, fight back. And, and, and I think that the archival repatriation of documents is an important first step. Um, I think that uh, the uh, available access is 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 uh, to 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 the public is is a, is an important step, but I feel like we need the materials to imagine the past, um, and without those materials to imagine the past, we'll never be able to investigate the the hypothesis, for example, that Director Manalo was mentioning earlier, that it's quite possible that the late 18th century was a period of great originality and innovation. You know, I was just thinking, and this goes back to a talk that, that went, I was going on yesterday about Maglalatik, you know, the, the, the Moro Moro dances. It occurred to me just yesterday that the Moro Moro dances may not have come from Spain or Latin America. They might've come from England because the Morris dances that the British brought with them to uh, uh, the Manila uh, uh, are very much like the uh, maglalatik that they that they practice the dance that is practiced today. So you know, I mean, there there are these there are these connections, there are these relationships, there are these uh, points of um, of origin and efflorescence and development that we can't explore until we begin to have the elements of imagining what the past could be or could have been. Uh, in order to not only begin the construction of the story, uh, but also to understand what the relationship of constructing that story has to do with our powers of self-determination and self-assertion now. And I think that that's the greatest thing that we can give uh, our you know, generation, our, our future generations in the Philippines to imagine the past so that they're empowered to reimagine the relationship between the present and the future. So maybe if, if there's something in open question, if we could talk about either the coordination of archives and museums, uh, uh, the necessity of repatriating beyond the archive, um, uh, or of having more ways of, um, you know, uh, uh, bringing those materials back to allow uh, students to be able to imagine uh, their past in order to imagine their future. Thank you. Would you like to answer? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to have engendered that question, Jody, because this is one good, uh, one good opportunity to share my great um, frustration for years um, because uh, nobody really listens. <laughs> and there are very few opportunities for this kind. No? Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm very happy for this uh, uh, now to ignite i always use the word ignite no we have to ignite the youth and uh, our students uh to to do this uh make them aware ricky when you talk about ignite it's kind of scary for archives <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I still uh, know. I still uh, know. Yeah. <laughs> Material culture, at least. Um, I, I do feel that with the mapping, the, this global inventory of material is a first step. It's like a baseline because we just don't know what's out there. We don't know where they are. We, and so I guess the first step is always provenance research. How do we know what's there? And how, and and I have I have to say, since we launched the project in 2021, it's easier now once we establish a relationship with museums to be able to talk with them. So like we re digitally repatriated um, uh, uh, objects to the community, the source community in the Blaan. So now that we, so we brought, of course, photos, digital repatriation, but because they saw what they were and, and, and we fed back the reaction of the Blaan elders to the Field Museum in Chicago, they're able to see like, why? I mean, gosh, it really is of value to them. So what are we doing with these objects? They've nobody, it's never been exhibited. It's, it's just in these drawers. And then, but then you bring them to people and they're like, almost in tears really looking at these objects. So, but, so I think it's a first step uh, to create this relationship at least. Although of course you, with human remains, for example, there's always talks, I mean, it's easier to do and a lot of, of museums are doing it, but of course with more kind of, yeah, you probably have experience. Yeah, I'd like to add to that. Of course, it's really important to uh, retrieve our, uh, you know, our, our heritage and objects of our culture. But I think it's equally important to um, to pay attention to the narrative around these objects. And that's where I think the, the scholarship comes in because um, meanings of objects change and you can bring back objects to the current uh, community, the current stakeholders, but they're not necessarily familiar with original meanings of all these objects that they're seeing. So I think it's very important to have you know, uh, scholars really focus on uh, uh, researching the objects and also being aware of the colonial narratives that have surrounded these objects before, which may not be the, the, the actual story. Uh, you know, we talk about decolonialization, and I think we have to decolonialize the narratives around these objects that are coming back to us, and um, um, not to make a plug about the Trans-Pacific, the intertwined exhibition uh, that's ongoing now, and we're having a book coming out, but um, I feel this is one of the, uh, you know, the current steps that we're taking to rectify the false narratives that we've been fed with. You know, the, we talk about the miseducation of the Philippines and we're made ashamed of our culture that, you know, this is a derivative culture, it's a bastard culture, and there's no authentic Filipino. But um, another way of looking at it is really that is what makes us Filipino is the intertwining of all these various cultures. And they're not superposed upon each other. They're actually intertwined. And it's very difficult now to disentangle all of that because the strength of the culture lies precisely in those imbricated intertwined strands that you don't want to dismantle because that's where the resilience lies. Um, so I think while it is important to uh, retrieve and repatriate whether in physical form or in digital form, uh, objects, material objects of our culture, it's equally important to get the story straight, to get the story, to weave the stories around these objects in a, a decolonial, in a, in, in a different way. Um, and I think also it's very important, I, I'd like to, um, uh, pay homage to the work that Rike Jose has done, the work that Ino Manalo is, you know, in the midst of trying to do with, um, you know, making all these, uh, um, making all these resources available to us and available to researchers. And it's not an easy task. It's, you cannot digitize things overnight. Um, you know, with all these millions of 
of documents. I think we're so used to the digital age where everything's at our fingertips and fingertips, and we expect to just you know stay in our homes and click and access all of these materials. Um, so I, I think we also need to have a little bit of patience and understanding with the challenges that are being faced, especially in Manila. You don't have all the resources that, let's say, at the Getty, you know, they can digitize all these things because they have these advanced um, machines that you know, people don't even have to touch, just feed it there and they're just, you know, digitizing. To work together. <laughs> right. And, and, you know, maybe we could explore ways of maybe applying for larger grants, um, you know, justifying it as a way of uh, uh, advancing, you know, global understanding. It's not just for Philippine um, uh, scholars, it's for scholars uh, globally who are interested in these topics that we can have more support, you know, to help all these different uh, initiatives and maybe, you know, I, I think it's fun if I have to go to, you know, certain places. I, I, I you know, it's more efficient to have just one central area and just you know click and have it there but kind of also you know minimizes this excitement of I'm going to this archive here and the archive there and um <laughs> right but anyway, I mean, yeah obviously the, the the end goal is to make it more easily accessible um but I think we also have to yeah. realize all the challenges that but that we do, I, I do feel we do need to really think seriously about it about it yeah like for 800 oh, how many 8 million records that yeah. 18 million Enough without without uh, yeah absent from the history yeah. of the writing of history yeah. in the philippines we'll i mean that's machines, just um, we'll but, uh, yeah you, you were talking about um, you know repatriation and then the searching for records and mm. digitizing i think what's important also is to figure out an end goal in which you try to maximize the the interaction of these records with the general public, especially the young people, no? And like it or not, is we really don't have people. I mean, there's hardly anyone left in the Philippines who speaks Spanish. No? So the question is what to do with this. And I think with groups like um, Ayala Foundation and the Aboitis Foundation in Cebu, uh, one, one program that we hope to evolve from our records is how to use our records in training people for tour guiding, for example, to use it in tour in tour guides, in tourism, so that uh, you know people can can benefit from them in a more direct way, no? Because I mean, definitely we need to continue with the scholarship programs and all that, but we need to also be able to use our this the data that we or the stories, the narratives that we find as a basis of activities that are income generating. And that uh, also, really react also, to, uh, to we everyday saw, life. No? We Thank saw you. from we saw from um, Christina's workshop yesterday that uh, you know just because you speak Spanish doesn't necessarily mean you can transcribe all yeah. of these things. There would have to be a fleet of uh, trained, yeah. um, you know. Yeah, the and levels so, of access. So something actually that yeah. uh, John D was talking about also no? about using how to use this the information that, or the narratives especially that we find in our records yeah thank you no yeah because the, the dig, digital access is always baseline no? but of course access has to be has to go beyond that no Christina. let's we allow christina <laughs> can just i just say something i can't you know i don't lunch is ready outside no, i'm so sorry yeah i mean i i really think it's the collaborative efforts are super important because you know one thing that nobody has talked about is how much money everything takes and i can tell you um you know now being in charge of this grant it takes a lot of money to put i mean even news from the page um you know that is at least a thousand dollars for the basic level subscription which you know it can be handled by an institution like princeton but um you know that's that's a huge amount of money for uh, any institution in the Philippines, even the national institutes. So, um, you know, I think people have to be convinced that a big 
you know, money investment has to go into this. Yeah. So, um, and so it's not just a lack of will, I think it's, a, you know, it's a lack of will, but also yeah. where and how do you find the funding? Yeah. And the reality of it is the funding is in the States and it's in Europe. Um, and, and the funding goes for collaborative projects. Yes. And so you have to be also willing to have scholars in the US who are willing to, US and Europe who are willing to put in the time. It takes a lot of time to, to, to do it, to put together a grant proposal. And it takes a lot of time to, to run it. And this kind of, uh, the reality is this kind of projects do not get recognized as scholarship by American institutions. So if you're untenured, um, this is not the kind of thing that is the best, you know, that that is conducive to tenure because, well, even today is required for tenure is a monograph. To be a full professor, you need another monograph, a single author monograph. So, I mean, I think, you know, you need to, you, I think, you know, this kind of thing is important. It's also important for international scholars, and this is on us, to recognize the importance of working with Philippine scholars, Filipino scholars, and working in Filipino archives, and working with Filipino bibliography, which is not happening, you know, in the, I mean, now I'm starting, I just let my blood. <laughs> but, um, you know, we, we, how many books have been published about the Spanish Pacific or the, or the Philippines where the bibliography is lacking um, in terms of recognizing all the Filipino scholars who have been doing work all these years and um, not citing Filipino sources, citing secondary sources, in fact, because these scholars are not going to the Philippines. And what I hear um, from young scholars oftentimes is, well, we don't, you don't really need, I've been told you don't really need to go there because everything is in Seville, everything is in their Chivo General de Indias. There's, there's really, there are no archives in the Philippines and we've heard this and, um, and then, you know, of course we encourage young scholars to go to, to UST, for example, and they're shocked. They're amazed at the stuff they find, you know, and they feel really betrayed by, you know, us, right? I mean, that we, why is it that we haven't told them that they should go to the Philippines? So I think the, the collaboration is really, really key here. And I, I think it's important to, um, you know, ideally we would have Filipino scholars taking the leadership in every single project. Um, but in reality, I think, you know, a lot of the efforts have to come from the outside because that's where the funds are. Mm. Thank you so much. We that. need to make these colonial powers guilty. Uh, <laughs> get, get grant more grants. So anyway. Make them happy. Yeah. <laughs> so um, with that, we close this uh, uh, discussion. Thank you very much all for participating. Sorry if uh, we have not been able to accommodate all questions, but we are behind schedule. So Please let's uh, enjoy lunch now and then we'll come back at 1.30 to uh, the second.